be it the, the slides, uh, as well as um, links to the recording itself to be able to share with folks who were not able to attend uh, tonight. Um, so with that, uh, Well, good, good evening again, everyone. Um, that's a nice picture of the skyline. And there's no rain for a change. Uh, we will have a welcome. And, so, and um, then we, you can see from our agenda, we'll talk about uh, flood resilience initiatives in the context of other work going on in our county, the study process to date, uh, a renewed vision and a, 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 a concepts of how we can, um, as a community, find a way to protect ourselves from the damages of storm surge, but do, in a way, do it in a way that we think best fits Miami-Dade County. Uh, and in partnership with a host of other entities, uh, including in the leadership of the United States Corps of Engineers. Next steps in engagement, and then we will stay on the line for open discussion and questions and answers. Uh, some ground rules to help us get to everyone when we get to the question and answers. Please remain muted throughout the presentation and question and answer and the Q&A unless you are called on. And we will be monitoring, uh, I guess, raised hands, Christian, is that the? Uh... Yep, toward the end, uh, we can, we'll yeah. allow folks to raise their hands. Well. Yeah, yep. please enter all questions and comments in the chat box, sorry. And moderators will be monitoring the chat and reading the questions out loud. And if we don't get all your questions during this meeting, we will answer it in the Q&A document that will be mailed out to all the participants and will be posted on the project webpage. Well, I am not the mayor, but uh, I can assure you that absent a, a, a unexpected uh, change in her schedule, she will be joining us, I think, uh, within the hour. But it is my great pleasure to introduce uh, the commanding uh, commander of the Norfolk District, United States Corps of Engineers, and the leader of a great partnership that the Corps has with Miami-Dade County on this project, uh, Colonel Brian Halberg. Colonel. All right, I think we have Colonel on mute. Is that right? Still not coming through. Might be still double muted, Colonel. Can you hear me now? Yes, sir. There we go. We lost you. We lost you, Colonel. We had you when you say, can you hear me now? And then. How about now? Yes, sir. All right. I'm not going to yes. close the window this time. <laughs> thank you, Jim, for the kind comments. Um, good evening, everyone. I want to thank. Mayor Cava, I know she'll uh, attend in a little bit, and the Miami-Dade County and everyone participating in tonight's public webinar. The work accomplished over the last 10 months would not have been possible without the coordinated efforts of Miami-Dade County, the Corps of Engineers, a whole host of uh, various stakeholders and the municipalities, and of course, the public. With the reinitiation of this study in August of 2022, together, we have had the unique opportunity during part one to work alongside the county to develop new alternatives to the previous 2021 recommended plan. While we are nearing completion of part one in August, we are only just beginning to roll up our sleeves for the evaluation and analysis that lies ahead in part two, as we'll work together to tackle the complex issue of coastal storm surge flooding in Miami-Dade County one of the numerous flood risks faced by the county. During the November charrette, 
I presented the principles of partnership, otherwise known as the three C's, and I'll go over them again. They're collaboration, commitment, and communication. And as we move ahead into the go, no-go meeting with the Assistant Secretary of the Army for Civil Works on August 3rd, I'd like to circle back on the three C's and reflect on how we successfully implemented these principles over the last 10 months. I'm going to start off with communication. As I defined it as the principle of being open and transparent, having consistent communication, and soliciting input so we all have shared understanding of the project purpose, how to achieve success, and the specific measures to achieve the desired end state. We're happy to reflect on our progress to achieve consistent, open, and transparent engagements with Miami-Dade County communities, the environmental justice communities, local stakeholders, and subject matter experts. Our continued communication efforts are critical to the study's success. That is why over the last the past 10 months, we expanded our communication efforts to include two well-attended charrettes, three public engagement opportunities, an in-person meeting, and two virtual meetings. We held six interagency meetings and numerous other engagements with municipalities and stakeholders. We value the input of the community and the stakeholders and recognize the importance of their involvement in shaping the future of coastal storm risk management in Miami-Dade County. As we look to part two, together we will continue to broaden our community engagement efforts to ensure economically disadvantaged communities can, to, can participate in this feasibility study process. Now on to collaboration. We define collaboration as building and sustaining strong, cohesive, and diverse teams that work together to proactively solve problems in a manner that achieves common goals and mutually beneficial outcomes. When the study reinitiated in August of 2022, our Norfolk District and Miami-Dade County team hit the ground running to build a strong, diverse, and cohesive team that had the experience to tackle this tough problem. We expanded our team to bring in experts from numerous USACE divisions, including Engineering with Nature. The Norfolk District and Miami-Dade County staff met weekly to plan, brainstorm, and discuss study efforts. We recently established a core integration team to unify the numerous core projects in the Miami-Dade County area, such as the Central and South Florida Resiliency Study, the Biscayne Bay Southeastern Everglades Restoration Project. This represents a handful of the collaboration efforts that have occurred since last August to align common goals. And finally, to commitment. We define commitment as all parties being invested and actively engaged to achieve the desired outcomes while embracing innovation and accepting measured risk. Together, we are all committed to developing creative solutions that manage coastal storm risk in Miami-Dade County. Tonight, I recognize the commitment of Miami-Dade County as a non-federal sponsor for the, the study leading to the renewed vision for the communities and spearheading the efforts of advancing the new alternative concepts developed based on extensive stakeholder and public input received over the last 10 months. The Norfolk District team is committed to a path forward in supporting the county's vision. In closing, we've achieved what we set out to do 10 months ago in part one. This is a very complex study, and while the scope of the study has expanded under the two new alternative concepts, we feel confident that the efforts completed to date establish a framework to build upon as we look to the future and the next steps. In August, the Assistant Secretary of the Army for Civil Works will decide on the best path forward for part two of the study towards achieving the county's renewed and expanded vision for managing coastal storm risk. I wanna thank you for joining us tonight and your participation and involvement in the study. Thank you, Colonel Halberg. So we will, I, I think the, the Colonel uh, gave me a great segue there to talk about uh, the numerous types of projects uh, that are ongoing in our area. Um, and 
from the county standpoint, we try to integrate these opportunities to work on new projects with the core or, or, or the South Florida Water Management District uh, through our adaptation approaches that we have laid out in the uh, sea level rise strategy. Uh, we had a progress report that we put out last year. We'll have another one coming out this fall. And, and it, it builds on the idea that as, as we experience the short and long-term impacts of a changing climate, uh, that we'll look for opportunities to expand on the landscape ways to protect ourselves from the events that we know can happen from a hurricane or a, a, an intense flooding event. Uh, and also understand that other aspects of the, of the landscape are changing. Groundwater is, is having uh, an impact in changing. So we have to think about a new landscape and, and to build on the ways that we can best uh, adapt. We feel that this will give us the opportunity to have a, 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 a fruitful future here, uh, building on this landscape just as they did in the last 100 years, uh, something appropriate for the next 100 years. The projects um, that are on this slide, which we've developed over time, some are directly related, others are, are, are perhaps a little uh, are tangential, but, but they represent investments being made in our community um, with our partners at the South Florida Water Management District, uh, the, you know, the Corps of Engineers entire family, the, our home district in, Norfolk, in Jacksonville, uh, the expertise of the Norfolk District doing the Back Bay study, the special uh, uh, age, uh, research arms that the Corps has put at our disposal. And we want to we want to be sure that we are moving forward a project such as the Back Bay in a way that it is uh, integrated and leverages the opportunities for multiple benefits from thinking about Everglades restoration, thinking about how we will retool the Central and South Florida uh, flood project, the original project that was built across our landscape to provide drainage. Uh, how we'll make continued improvements on our beach. Uh, with the help of the of Jacksonville District, we got our beach project reauthorized uh, last year. And we have more to do and that we want to see that integrated, we hope, um, with, with some of the actions we'll talk about this morning. Uh, improvements to the Port of Miami. Uh, this gain, the, the village of Key Biscayne will be doing a pilot study, uh, taking into consideration many of the the elements and measures that we're talking about today uh, that will be applied countywide. And of course, these efforts have to be uh, coordinated with the res resilience study and level of service plans of the South Florida Water Management District, our key partners in our 34 municipalities working on their uh, stormwater plans and other resilience efforts, a Biscayne Bay uh, water quality insurance plan and, and yet to be uh, initiated, but coming is a watershed management plan uh, led by our chief bay officer, uh, Rella Begay, and our watershed board uh, chaired by Commissioner Cohen Higgins. And we just had a final report on the South Florida Military Installation Resilience Review, where we have actions proposed uh, to protect our very important military installations. We can weave all this together into a, a, a far-reaching investment in our future. And tonight, we're going to look at one of those, the Back Bay Coastal Storm Risk Management Study. But you have the commitment of the county, and I know of the core, that we are going to keep this uh, level set with all these other projects and to have transparency to all the stakeholders as to what is happening, how they can get information, uh, and how they can be part of the process. So we expect... Uh, to be dealing with water. Water comes is sort of basic to the landscape of South Florida. It's our the groundwater, the, 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 the fantastic resources that the Biscayne Bay, Bay Aquifer brings us. But of course, we all know it's also, of course, geology that means we have a groundwater situation which will constantly be affected by surface water and other events. 
We'll have flooding in the canals. That's what they were designed for, to, to pull the water from the secondary and tertiary canal systems, move it to tide. But with the volumes of rain we're experiencing, we'll have canal flooding. Uh, we have a history of dealing with saltwater intrusion, great partnerships with the United States Geological Survey and the South Florida Water Management District and our experts at, at Water and Sewer Department. So we'll keep track of saltwater intrusion, but it will be magnified by many of the events and changing conditions we're talking about. We know we'll have shoreline erosion. That's why we maintain our beaches to, to mitigate that erosion. And where we don't have a beach, we're gonna be talking about nature-based uh, interventions. And, and we storm surge is that thing that we now know from Hurricane Ian and the Southwest Florida F, um, experience is what we have to really think about. It's not going to spare us if we have a hurricane coming ashore in Dade County. That's why we're doing this back bay study in collaboration with the other studies. <clears throat> so there are a lot of measures that we'll talk about tonight, uh, but think about the landscape. Think about how we're surrounded by water. We have water effects of, of the groundwater underneath us. We have to be thinking about the future and how the conditions are changing and how we can adapt to that. Next slide. Now this magnifies the storm surge phenomena, uh, the building of a, a, a storm surge mound of water on top of mean sea level, you know, what, what we would expect a subject to tides uh, to be out there on a, on a, on a sunny day. But then in the, in, in the action of that hurricane coming ashore, it's pushing that wall of water was so vivid in the, in the uh, iPhone tapes that we can all see online from Southwest Florida. And that causes the, the, the damage, the, the damage to buildings, to personal property, uh, to the environment. Um, and of course, top of our list of protection is, is our residents and visitors. We will have to get them out of harm's way, but then we have to recognize that that the damage that can be caused is a prime, is a secondary, a, a, an equal focus to, to uh, our responsibility to our citizens. So it can come ashore any place. We know from the Hurricane Center, they're doing more and more each uh, season to give us a longer time frame, what to expect, where to expect the uh, storm surge flooding, where are the evacuation zones. Um, but that's what this is about, storm surge, that wall of water that comes with a hurricane. Next slide, please. So we have pulled this together and you'll, you're gonna hear more detail on each one of these measures. And if you start, uh, in the first category to, to the left, storm surge barriers. These things are, are being applied all over the world. So we cannot be afraid of these. We have to understand how do they fit in Miami-Dade County. Perhaps our experience that was unsuccessful the first time we did this study is maybe the best learning experience we could have had because we figured out what we didn't want. Now it's incumbent on us to figure out what we do want and how it's going to fit as part of a series of measures that we can take. It could mean raised roadways. It could mean raising the, uh, the, the beach walk. We have to have, we may need uh, and will need uh, some barriers at the opening of the navigational canals uh, and, and applications uh, along some of the um, uh, bridge bridge evacuation routes in the south and north to be sure that if we are going to go with with a series of structures that they operate the way they're going to be designed to operate. That's going to be key. We have a lot more work to do with the Corps about that. But, but we as a county are saying this is not off the table. We know what we don't want. Now we want to understand what we do want in the area of barriers. The area group B is um, really the uh, an area we talked about the first time around, but we greatly have expanded on, on this. And I want to hand uh, praise to the Norfolk team for coming down and sitting down for long meetings with our partners at Department uh, Division of Environmental Resource Management uh, to think about the things that 
Durham has been thinking about, uh, especially in South Dade. How can we do things uh, in that area to really build and leverage different initiatives? How can we use the reef, both natural and artificial, to be part of the lines of defense that break down the energy of that oncoming uh, storm surge wave? We have a great dune system. Uh, we can enhance it, and it can be uh, well part of a, of a line of defense as we move forward. And then where we have our natural areas, protect them and expand on them, and where we can use living shorelines, uh, apply that uh, from the expertise that we're learning. Then category C is very important. This, this no matter what we do, uh, and all through the years that we've been studying this, we knew that there are legacy homes in our community that need to be elevated and, com and commercial facilities that need to be flood proof. Uh, we cannot just expect every dwelling to be torn down and rebuilt to the new code. That's going to leave us in a community where everybody is a millionaire that can afford to do that. We have a lot of people that uh, we have a responsibility to find cost effective ways to keep them in their homes. And that's why these non-structural measures uh, of elevating your residential homes and flood proofing, they, they are embedded in any combination of things we do. Next slide. I get the chance now to uh, hand this over to Michelle Ammer, the Chief Planning and Policy Branch, and to thank her and Faraz and Abby and the entire team at Norfolk for hanging in there with Miami-Dade County. They have been listening. They have been trying as much as they can and they're under some pretty tough guidelines, but they have been trying to bring this home uh, to meet the goals that uh, our mayor set out along with the Assistant Secretary. So Michelle, thank you. Thank you, Jim. And we are very happy to continue this collaboration and look forward to where this study goes into the future. All right, Christian, next slide. So just a little bit of background of where the initial study uh, began and where we ended. Uh, we began in February of 2018. Uh, this was uh, as a result of emergency supplemental uh, resulting from the hurricanes of Harvey, Irma, and Maria. And the uh, opportunity was to uh, do a three-year, $3 million study to evaluate the risk on the coast in Miami-Dade County. In in the back bay, excuse me, uh, to evaluate what opportunities could be uh, formulated and recommended to reduce that risk moving forward. Uh, we signed a feasibility cost share agreement in October 2018, and that initiated the study. Uh, we did community collaboration and public meetings. We had a um, what's called a tentatively selected plan as we were working through the formulation of alternatives, we selected a plan and that following the selection of the plan, we published a draft report in June of 2020. We incorporated all of that comment, all of the comments and input, and we were working on a final report uh, to submit to our policy and legal compliance team. Uh, but one of those requirements uh, prior to submission was a letter of support and Miami-Dade County understandably uh, reviewed that recommended plan and, and uh, as Jim mentioned, uh, noticed that there were some things that they could not support. But I will mention as we are moving forward, there were some definite um, measures within that recommended plan that we agree are win-wins. Uh, certainly critical infrastructure that provides broad resilience to the community. So being able to evaluate and flood proof critical infrastructure uh, that had broad support and then non-structural measures as Jim was mentioning that had all additional broad support. And certainly we've heard very clearly the support for natural nature-based features. So as we have been working through part one and we hope to work uh, into part two, uh, we'd like to continue to evaluate those opportunities, um, evaluating uh, those features moving forward. So in December of 2021, I'll, I'll back up a little bit, our three-year study expired in October of 2021. So to be able to start again, we did need to get additional time and funding. And in December uh, 2021, Mayor Kava submitted a request uh, to 
uh, have additional time and funding so that we could work with the county to uh, identify an alternative that they could support moving forward. In August of 2022, uh, the Assistant Secretary of the Army for Civil Works approved an additional uh, 60 months and $8.2 million in federal funding uh, to support the study. But that was in two parts. One, the first part was this one year to allow Miami-Dade County to develop the alternatives that they would support moving forward. And certainly we have been intimately collaborating with them in uh, working through those alternatives. And then that second part, as we meet in August to uh, present to the Assistant Secretary of the Army, uh, we will present a scope and schedule for that second part moving forward. So the two parts of this additional time and funding. Moving into part one, we have done, we have completed two charrettes, one in November and one in March. Well attended charrettes uh, with lots of uh, input and we greatly appreciate all of that input. We have conducted public meetings, great input from the public. We really appreciate that. And we have conducted additional meetings moving forward as well. So thank you for again, participating in today. We greatly appreciate all of your time and effort and the input that you're providing to the study. And all of this of course is working towards that go no go meeting uh, with Mayor Kava and the Assistant Secretary of the Army for Civil Works. And certainly we'll present the uh, path forward and then uh, be a decision point for him whether we move into part two. But we're all excited and hopefully are hoping to move to part two so that we can evaluate uh, the opportunities to partner, continue to partner with Miami-Dade County on um, measures to reduce risk within Miami-Dade County. The Finally, the, the culmination of part two will be a chief's report and why that is important is a chief's report is coordinated through Congress and could ultimately be um, authorized within a water resources development act. And that would authorize construction. Of course, after it is authorized, the study could then move into what's called pre-construction engineering and design. That's where the study, it, the the recommended plan is designed further until we get to our first contract and then we can move into what's called construction uh, and then continue to design other features of the recommended plan, but then can start you know, do some construction. Of course, as you can imagine, and as kind of outlined on, on this timeline, that takes a number of years, so certainly would not happen tomorrow, but take additional collaboration and in addition, each of those phases that we're talking about, pre-construction engineering and design would require an additional agreement with Miami-Dade County. And before we moved into uh, construction, that would uh, require what's called a project partnership agreement, uh, again, moving forward. So there are different gates in between these phases uh, before they would be able, before we'd be able to move in. Uh, next slide. So this is just a a real uh, overview summary of the charrettes that, that took place again in November and March of this year. Uh, in November, we visited a number of communities and really got to see uh, different perspectives uh, for um, opportunities of measures that we could include, we could evaluate to reduce risk. I believe we were in certainly Miami-Dade County, we're in the city of Miami, and then also, I believe we're also in uh, Coral Gables. So just an opportunity to look uh, more broadly through the, the study area. And then in March, we were able to, and thanks to the Board of Miami uh, hosted us, and we were able to um, further those uh, evaluations and those alternatives moving forward, and then certainly culminating today in the public webinar. These are, uh, I believe these slides will be available and you can scan them and view the YouTube videos. So as uh, Colonel Halberg, Halberg was mentioning, uh, collaboration is very important and we have conducted ourselves, the Corps of Engineers uh, and with Miami-Dade County and then also Miami-Dade County has also uh, conducted a number of uh, meetings to reach out to the different agencies to get feedback that they're going to be important in the 
conduct of the feasibility study. We have environmental compliance that we have to complete to successfully achieve a chief's report. And so reaching out to the resource agencies to help us understand where the concerns may lie and the additional information we may need in the feasibility study moving forward. Those are really important contacts. And then certainly um, the number of stakeholders that would be uh, engaged and also uh, potentially affected by a recommended plan. Just reaching out and having those initial conversations and that continued discussion moving forward is very helpful to make sure that we're capturing um, the concerns and the comments and, and really trying to anticipate, how, again, what those concerns or comments may be. And I, I will uh, mention that I've been happily surprised that the conversations have been very um, have been very positive and just really people are looking for additional information. Um, so that's been a, a motivating and, and a, 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 uh, it's been, again, a good positive conversation. Christian, next slide. Oh, thank you. So again, working on the design shred in March, uh, again, lots of uh, attendees. It was really great to see such an uh, interest in the charrette and coming together with ideas on how we could, uh, you know, where we could, um, in partnership with Miami-Dade County and other stakeholders within the county. As Jim was mentioning, this is a very complex problem and it, the Corps of Engineers may not have the end-all solution that solves all the problems and we're not expecting that. We believe it will be a quilt work of different programs that Miami-Dade County is already partnering on with a number of different partners that will really provide the comprehensive approach for Miami-Dade County. And what we're looking at uh, through this feasibility study is where are those opportunities that the Corps can help improve resilience in Miami-Dade County. We can contribute to that quilt work that's already in that works uh, to help the resilience in Miami-Dade County. Next slide. One of the uh, opportunities, now I'll just step back for a second, is uh, looking at comprehensive benefits. Now, when we conducted the original study, uh, we were uh, developed in 2020, our, our draft report, we already evaluated comprehensive uh, benefits as we look at, look at our studies. But our direction, our policy directive was really to dig into what are those additional opportunities that are, benefits to our plans um, that may be broader than coastal service management. So that's the study authority, as Jim was mentioning earlier, that's the study authority that we use. The permission from Congress that we have is really to evaluate coastal storm risk. But when we talk about measures like natural and nat natural and nature-based features, they provide other opportunities such as environmental quality, uh, there's the opportunity for recreation or certainly of life benefits, recreation bene recreational benefits, if that natural nature-based feature uh, is somehow pulled into a park situation. So now you're improving life and health and quality of the citizens. So really trying to capture all the benefits that the measures within a recommended plan can provide, and that should be uh, included to tell the entire story of what the recommended plan again provides for the county. So additional benefits that we uh, evaluate include regional economics. When you construct a project that uh, provides uh, certainly uh, salaries and money within the region and that provides some additional benefits and then looking at all the social effects um, that are provided by those measures and then also again looking environmental quality we are looking kind of high level at this moment as we're looking at the measures that will be included in the in the alternatives moving forward but we'll really d dig in deep when we get into part two and we'll um, work with the county to identify what those uh, benefits look like and certainly what um, we can use to describe uh, those again those additional benefits next slide So we were, as I mentioned earlier, we were given one year from the start of the approval, which was in, which was in August of 2022, and that will end August of 2023. So we've had 10 months in, we've done a lot of work, we've collaborated very closely, we've had multiple meetings a week, 
to work through the uh, plans moving forward. Uh, and we'll continue to do that certainly in part two. We're looking at, again, those measures that are opportunities to reduce coastal storm risk, and we will include sea level rise in that evaluation. I think I would agree certainly with Colonel Hallberg's assessment and Jim's assessment. I think we are a much better place than we were during the original feasibility study. Uh, we worked more closely together, and I think we have a, a better uh, collective understanding of what Miami-Dade County has in is in its vision moving forward. Certainly, we'll, we'll need to continue to work forward to make sure that we're in alignment, but I agree we're in a much better place than we were previously. I'm looking forward to the August Go No Go meeting, uh, and that will be the kickoff if approved. That'll be the kickoff for the remaining four years of the approved time moving forward. And then we'll dig into that analysis and do some deeper design or some additional design and, and deeper analysis moving forward. Next slide. And in part two, again, this will be more of the traditional feasibility study. We'll, all, we'll evaluate alternatives uh, to look at, uh, certainly from the federal perspective, we will evaluate alternatives that um, how they contribute to federal interest. So when we're looking, we're conducting a feasibility study, we are looking at federal interest. So if we're trying to explain to someone in the middle of uh, the, uh, I'm sorry, uh, in the United States, why it's important to invest in Miami-Dade County, we're looking at evaluating that return on investment. But even more broadly, we will uh, add that additional explanation and description using comprehensive benefits. So the full description of what the benefit is uh, for that plan moving forward. And we'll do that in alignment with Miami-Dade County. Uh, a very important part that Jim was mentioning earlier, there's a lot going on in Miami-Dade County, a, lot of, a number of studies, and it will be very important that we continue to collaborate with those studies. And so that we can uh, look at opportunities for comp um, complementing, but also making sure that uh, what is uh, formulated and recommended in those plans is included or accounted for in our plan so that we're working together as one system versus uh, you know, duplicating efforts or just making sure that we're talking between the different studies, certainly. And then as also, as Jim was mentioning earlier, the multiple lines of defense. Absolutely, when you look at those opportunities in the slides or, or the graphic down the bottom, it's a number of different stakeholders that provide that multiple line of defense, including a non-structural uh, measure such as increased building design to reduce risk as you uh, have new development, you build to higher standards so that you can reduce the risk into the future. So some of these pieces of that multiple line of defense fall into different um, jurisdictions, but we're but the combination of them all provide the multiple lines of defense that help for a more comprehensive uh, view and um, solution to uh, coastal storm risk. And then at the end of it, certainly that commitment to um, more robust community engagement, having additional uh, public meetings and getting, getting additional uh, public comments about the study, not only now, but also into the future so that we can be accounting for uh, kind of the view from the, the county and the, the citizens. Next slide. So I know I'm going to be handing it off to Lynette, but thank you so much for the opportunity to share for the study. We're very happy. We're very um, thankful to be continuing to work with Miami-Dade County, and we look forward to working with them in the future and uh, coming back to you with some results from our Go No Go meeting. Lynette? Lynette Great, fantastic. Lynette, before you uh, start, uh, I would like to take the, this uh, brief opportunity to thank uh, the entire Miami-Dade team uh, from the Office of Resilience, from our county departments, from uh, our municipalities, uh, our excellent uh, uh, consulting firm, you, hear, you who you were about to hear from one of our their lead uh, players, uh, Lynette. Uh, and <clears throat> special thanks to our, our advisor, uh, retired Colonel Roxalt, who um, uh, served in uh, a career in the United States military, uh, retired to Miami, and has been a constant voice of experience and uh, 
and wisdom uh, to all this involved with this process. Thank you, Rock. And uh, Lynette, go ahead, please. Thank you. Thank you. Hello. Hi, I'd just here, like Tim. to pause. Oh, we look who's still, here. Uh, managed to get in. Hello, everybody. Hi, hi Mayor. Uh, well, <laughs> let, let us substitute you for Lynette. <laughs> yes, well, well, Lynette has really the information. I just have greetings. So well, please go ahead. <laughs> well worth the wait. <laughs> uh, please go ahead, Mayor Kava. Thank you so much. I just want to say good evening to everyone. I'm very, very grateful that you joined us, uh, that you're taking the time for these important updates and questions. Uh, that you can launch. We really want to help everyone understand what's at stake, what's going on, all about our Back Bay uh, study. And we could not move forward without the critical input from our community, from our cities. And so it's really been essential to have so many people involved. Uh, it has been a very long process. Uh, I think you know that there was a reset button pushed, which actually has gotten a lot of national attention because apparently the Army Corps uh, you know, uh, doesn't often do that, but they were able to hear the input from the public and, and make note of how important it would be to start again. And so we're very, very grateful to our collaboration with the U.S. Army Corps and their willingness. So especially I want to thank Colonel Hallberg uh, and the Chief of Planning and Policy Branch of the Norfolk District of the U.S. Army Corps, Michelle Hammer, for uh, their continual support and for coming down here to Miami many times, many times to truly understand and listen to uh, the residents of our unique community. And I also wanna thank the entire Army Corps family, including the experts from the Jacksonville District, the Engineering with Nature Group, very, very important part of this. And they have come from all over the country to support us. Uh, in my visits to Washington, DC, I've had the opportunity to meet again with the Assistant Secretary of the Army for Civil Works, Michael Connor, who was the person who took the lead in, in helping to guide this, and his staff. And I want to particularly express uh, how grateful we are for them listening to our priorities and needs here in the county. I've been extremely pleased with their willingness to listen and support us. And the reinitiation of this study came after the Corps presented their first draft plan in 2021. Uh, you may know that it heavily featured gray infrastructure uh, and also a mangrove restoration project in Cutler Bay, but overall the 2021 plan did not reflect the values of our community. So I requested that we extend the study time with community input in mind, and this was done over the last nine months. So we have been working diligently with the Norfolk District to develop a set of locally identified alternatives that enhance our environment and urban core while reducing the risk from storm surge. This is a big win for Miami-Dade County. And with this extension, we've been able to better solicit feedback from our cities, our residents, nonprofit organizations, and our uh, universities and colleges. So we are working together to maximize nature-based solutions. And this is uh, innovative. This is something that is being talked about all over the world, and we are truly going to be able to put that into action. And we're also coordinating uh, the Back Bay study with other water-related infrastructure projects in our county and the Southeast Florida region. We have more uh, Army Corps projects than any place else in the country, so we know they, they really love us. Thank you. Uh, we've already hosted several public meetings to engage our local stakeholders. We've had consistently over 200 people at these events. I'm very proud of the engagement. You may know one of my four E's is engagement, environment, economy, engagement, and equity. So we take that very, very seriously. And tonight's briefing is going to bring everybody up to speed. Uh, we'll get a closer uh, uh, look as we approach the key milestone, which is August. That's when the Assistant Secretary of the Army's Public Works and I will decide together if this project is a go or no go. That's the terminology that they use. And I am confident that we will be able to move forward with consensus and will also be hosting more meetings as the process continues. So to make sure you don't miss a beat, you can sign up for updates through our Office of Resilience's newsletter at miamidade.gov resilience. 
I want you to know that as mayor and as a lifetime environmental advocate, I am making a commitment to everyone in our community. Miami-Dade County will continue to collaborate with all of our partners towards a solution that reflects our values and that protects us from storm surge and incorporates nature, nature-based solutions. So I wanna thank everyone for attending tonight. Again, you're gonna to hear from the experts, but I just wanted you to hear from me how important this is to me and to my administration. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jim. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Uh, Lynette, we're back with you. Fantastic. And I have to say that Madam Mayor said it much more eloquently than I'm going to say it, but I'll just reiterate that one of the main points is really that we're at this place today specifically because all of our stakeholders are um, community members, our non-governmental organizations, all the folks really came with ideas, participated in charrettes, have been participating in these sorts of meetings and calls and partnering with the Corps of Engineers to be able to look at, as we look at this renewed vision, what are the things that are very important to this community and how do we start working as partners continuing to move ahead? So with that said, um, let's get going. Okay, so we're going to talk a little bit more about these. Uh, Jim had these up earlier, as I recall, and we start to think about a couple of things. When you start to looking at managing coastal, managing coastal flood risk, there's two kind of like the bookends. You can start to think about it having the water be kept out or allowing the water to come in. And so when you start to think about storm surge barriers, option A that we have here, this would be one of those that would allow us to be able to keep the water out. And we've seen storm surge barriers in other areas around the world. Of course, we've got, we're very used to the canal structures that we see here, elevated roadways, levees. I mean, there's a lot of ways to be able to have particular barriers. And we'll talk a little bit more about that. The B option is being able to have these energy reducing features that can also be incorporated into nature based, sometimes hybrid green infrastructure. We hear a lot about these terms and you're going to see that for us as we start talking about incorporating these, we're bringing them into these lines of defense that would allow us to incorporate some hybrid reefs, some mangrove restoration, a lot of wetlands and of course continuing to enhance the dune systems that we have on our beautiful beaches. On the elevated adapt, that's something that Jim mentioned that was incredibly important that regardless of whichever, you know, as the plans continue to, to move ahead, regardless of the options, we know that there are going to be some areas that are going to have to either be elevated or have some type of flood proofing. And, you know, I, I need to point out that when we talk about non-structural, that's the way that is the kind of the jargon that we use with the Corps of Engineers. It's considered a non-structural, but you'll notice that they do have structural options. So I just want to always point that out that when we're talking about non-structural, it doesn't mean you won't be touching your structure. It's just an individual, you know, um, uh, uh, property level enhancement that is made with these elevating residential homes or also flood proofing the buildings. Um, so it's a lot, they're just kind of smaller scale. So um, let's keep going. Next one. So I mentioned these and I'll, I'll go through, you see that they're kind of color coded when you start to think about the one, two, three, and we start, we're going to go through these particular lines of defense. But if you start to look at it as different layers that provide protection as you're going from the water side to the land side, if we start with number one, it would be able to start to incorporate some of the projects that we already have in the Biscayne Bay area that are already looking at hybrid reefs. So being able to knock down some of the energy that's coming through with the waves, wind and the waves with some of that first line of defense. As we're looking towards the beach area, we already have a dune system in uh, Miami Beach. And if you go down to South Point, you'll be able to actually see what that looks like. And I think we have a couple of those slides later on. So I'll just move a little bit more quickly through this one. You can look at having adapted seawalls and a living shoreline on the back of the bay. Again, those are items that would help with the high frequency, less, um, less big storm surge stuff, but a lot of good smaller events that go by. We've got some enhanced islands in there. We know throughout the bay, there are some islands that were created um, decades ago, and those also function to help reduce energy and winds and waves as you're going from, you know, from the Atlantic side to the, uh, to the mainland. 
Of course, being able to expand the mangroves and number five is elevating the buildings and infrastructure. And we're gonna go through a few of these as we go along. In any plan, we always include critical facilities. And this can be some of the, you see here, the wastewater treatment plant and always included in their emergency response and being able to reduce the vulnerability of these critical assets is just, it's fundamental. So I would say as we continue to move forward and, you know, part two, this aspect of reinforcing critical facilities is one of those that's, that's a given. Now, how we include them and how we go ahead and protect them are some of the details that'll be worked out. But rest assured that as we're talking about some of these critical infrastructure facil facilities, all of these continually get looked at and will be included in the plans as we move ahead. Next slide, please. So as we started looking at the offshore options, you know, working our ways from one to five, starting to think about something like a hybrid reef and being able to have the examples that we've already seen with the University of Miami and some of the Miami-Dade County artificial reefs. The next part of the study would start to look at key considerations of how do you, where do you locate these? What depth, how, what are the sizes? How do we start to look at the benefits that they're bringing, not just from the wave energy reduction and some of the effectiveness that it can have to enhance that beach for nourishment, but also on the comprehensive benefit side of habitat creation. And of course, all of the enhanced tourism that we've got with people going out and really enjoying the reef. And finally, it also helps us to really, you know, have these educational and research opportunities. We see with the University of Miami and some of the very important reef um, you know, Madam Mayor has really highlighted the fact that we are in a prime location to be leaders in this world. And in this area of blue-green infrastructure, being able to, to be the leaders is another one of our goals. So next slide, please. The oceanfront shoreline, as I mentioned in South Point, we've got a great example of a dune system that's very, very healthy and quite high. In that particular area, we would be looking at, is there an option to be able to use the already approved plan for um, enhanced renourishment and continue to augment that where we could have some sort of elevated walkway, be able to plan some new, um, new dune and renourishment efforts that go along with the plan that's already in place and enhance some of those recreational benefits. That, that boardwalk area and that dune system right now is highly, highly used as a transportation route. We see people walking, biking, um, really important area for us to continue to maintain. So is there a way for us to continue to enhance the dune and use that as part of our second line of defense? These are some interesting diagrams of what it could look like. If you look at the, 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 the raised, the first one, it's a just looking at a raised dune and the one on the bottom also includes an elevated walkway. And in both, you see that it's very important to continue this beach renourishment project, the beach replenishment as we see there, continuing with that dune vegetation. And then that part behind, continuing to have that as an access route for recreation and of course the transportation that I mentioned. Next slide. Going on the uh, on the shoreline, one of the ways I mentioned is being able to keep the water out. So as we go around and start looking at how can we go ahead and protect from the storm surge, one of the options would be to use this beautiful barrier island that we've got as the first line of defense, that actual land structure. But then we'd need to go ahead and con close off the actual um, uh, inlets and provide that reduction of inundation and waves. Now, part of the important consideration for us is, of course, our, our wonderful water quality that we've got in the Bay, make sure that we are not impacting that water quality. And the one thing to note is that when we're talking about these storm surge barriers, these are structures that remain open. I mean, I would love to say all year round, that's, but that would just be if we don't get a storm moving through. So as we continue to see large impacts to hurricanes coming in, we would be closing them, but otherwise these are structures that would just remain open year round. Next slide. The Bayfront, so if you go behind the barrier island, you can really, again, uh, Miami Beach has a great example of Brittany Bay Park, a living shoreline area that, that one can already see. It looks really nice actually out there. And part of it is, uh, again, continuing to incorporate these 
gray and green structures that would allow us to continue to reduce some of the wave energy and absorb some of it for the high frequency events. So storms that aren't as big as the hurricanes do really, really well with some of these nature-based features that also allow us to improve some of the water quality and increase just, you know, the aesthetic value. We all want to live in places that are that continue to be beautiful and having these types of shorelines help with this aesthetic value. And something that we have there about, you know, you see there the comprehensive benefit of reinforcing evacuation routes is that along the causeways, there are a lot of areas that seem to be ripe for us to be able to incorporate some of these living shorelines. And so would that provide benefit to these critical corridors in ways that would allow us to continue to protect that gray infrastructure that's behind it? So next, uh, next slide. And I do realize I'm going quickly, folks. I'm just trying to um, get through our slides and allow for folks to have Q&A too. So now in the South Dade, one of the areas that we're incredibly excited is that it was identified in the 2021 plan. It's an area that we're really excited about is continuing to expand the uh, coastal wetlands down in the south of the county with enhancement with um, some of the marshes and the mangrove areas. So expanding on that coastal wetlands that we have that is already being planned with not just the county's eel program, the environmentally endangered lands, but all through, also through the BBC or so the Biscayne Bay, Southern Everglades, um, Ever and Everglades restoration projects, the coastal wetland projects that are down there. It's really important for those particular areas that we continue to interact with the other studies. I think Jim uh, early on showed us all the different studies that we had that come in through the county. The integration with those programs is really important as we continue to enhance the uh, um, the wetlands down south. So very excited about that one. This is one of the maps that will show us the, the uh, for the back bay, some of the areas that are continuing to get expanded. It's a little bit tougher to read this one because there's a lot of detail on it, but I just want to point out a couple areas. One is on the, the yellow call out at the top, the TSP Cutler Bay, that is an area that was already identified and continues to, we look at continue enhancement to see how can we incorporate them with the, the boundaries of the BBC -er and some of the environmentally endangered lands that we've continued to purchase throughout the county. So the proposal is really to go ahead and see, can we expand? Can we um, integrate and continue to have nature-based and hybrid features? Next, please. Flying areas, this is one of those where we continue to look at how are we going to be able to provide some of these non-structural um, ad, ad, um, adaptation features. And this would be looking at residential home raising and, of course, commercial flood proofing. We have a good example of a study that looks at this extensively in the Monroe County. The Florida Keys Comprehensive Storm Surge Risk Management Feasibility Study that was approved September of 2021 really takes the lead on being able to do some of this non-structural um, considerations at scale. And for us, it was really being able to have community cohesion and continue to have the conversation around some of the older structures or structures that may be of lower value um, in the benefit cost assessment, how is it that we can continue to allow for a more natural functioning of the floodplain, but also continue to create retrofit opportunities with the buildings and keeping people in the community. So allowing us to really have that community cohesion that is very important to, well, all of the communities that we work with. Next, please. Okay, so you know, the way we've been talking about some of our measures is really thinking about them as a bookend concepts. Like I mentioned before, you can think about it as using uh, the barrier island defense system with the storm surge gates to really just keep the water out or allow the water to come in and more elevate and adapt with nature. Now, all of these, as I mentioned, are going to continue to include the critical facilities. So as you look at this particular table, the ones um, uh, all the way down to like the, the, the fourth, where we're looking at residential elevation and commercial flood proofing, those would actually continue to be used in all of the identified areas. 
As we start to look at the barrier islands, we would have some of those gated storm surge barriers. And of course, with the reinforced dune and elevated system. And this is just one way to start to think about have you start to look at these bookend concepts. We're anticipating that as we get into phase two, part two, we would be looking at almost like a plug and play of these and optimizing the types of features that would ultimately be included in alternatives getting to the temporarily um, um, tentatively selected plan at the end of uh, the uh, part two. So next. These are some draft concepts. Folks have seen these before, but I'll go ahead and walk through them. Um, I know we get a lot of folks on the call that may not have seen them as not as familiar. And a couple things that I wanna point out on the left is the elevate and adapt, so the non-structural. So being able to uh, elevate the residential, flood proofing commercial buildings, and on the right would be looking at the barrier island, you know, using those as our primary defense system for the storm surge. What I do wanna point out is that both of them really reinforce some of the things that we heard during the workshops and the feedback. One was the expansion of nature-based features that wanted to be sure that um, we looked at opportunities to include that in whatever options we were moving forward with. The other one was really having this concept of multiple lines of defense. And we've talked about that as we walk through one through five, but making sure that those items, we thought about them that way and allowed for, um, uh, allowed for us to be able to think about including more people in, than the previous studies and just additional area for areas that could be have risk protected or have risk reduction. Now, the colors here, when you see the green down at the bottom on both slides, you'll start to see that they've got those particular green are the areas that were identified in the previous studies for the Cutler Bay wetlands. We went ahead and expanded it just with the green dots, and they're really just illustrative for us to be able to say that we're looking at all opportunities to be able to expand these nature-based features, these nature-based solutions. They're not specific areas, so um, I don't want folks to like zoom in and and think they're missing something if they don't see one on their spot or that these are confirmed. These are just air, uh, ways for us to look at it. The other thing to think about here is in both areas, in both studies, there's a study that there's the, um, when you see it in the coral color, it says main segment CSRM, and that's the beaches study. That's the area for us to be able to, it's already authorized. And it is the, what we have normally, you know, last 40 years been able to use as the uh, beach renourishment program. And so in both of those, as we continue to move forward, we would incorporate the enhancements that are being made through that study in our analysis. On the right, when we're looking at the barrier island, we start to look at that yellow line that comes around and it would really start to look at a reinforced dune system that would incorporate to the gates and being able to come around um, uh, Virginia Key, around the Rickenbacker. And what that does is brings the Central District Wastewater Treatment Plant, as well as Port Miami, two very important areas for Miami-Dade County into the Barrier Island Defense System. And I think we can keep going on this one. Again, taking a look at elevate and adapt with nature, with uh, with with um, with these examples on the left, you see the elevating the residential structures, and you'll see some of them with a work in progress. A lot of us are familiar with the Key West style or Key Large, you know, the Keys building where structures are already built. These are ones where you'd be having to elevate after the fact, and then again flood proof in commercial buildings, you'd need to look at the type and design for uh, the building, but there are systems all around and already deployed. One of the ones that we're um, starting to see a little bit more down here in Miami-Dade is Vizcaya with the different types of barriers that they're putting up for flood proofing. Next. This is another view of a barrier island uh, defense system. Again, you coming around. If you see that on the right, the reinforced dune system with the replenished beaches, you come across a uh, government cut. And again, the storm surge barriers would close only in time of, uh, uh, of a very major storm coming through. The barrier island, again, coming using Virginia Key and around the island into Rickenbacker. So using some ex existing um, existing uh, structural solutions, enhancing those and providing additional 
access for protection um, of the of the Rickenbacker Causeway down there. Next slide. Perfect. I'm gonna hand it over and happy to answer questions later on. Thank you. Thank you, Lynette. Uh, well, I think we've been over this stuff pretty well. Um, and you've seen the timeline. Um, we've got a year, uh, uh, part A or part one that we are, are completing. Uh, we're on track and we think you've heard everyone say that we feel better about where we are now than we have in the past. Uh, and we look forward to that go green flag uh, to get into the heavy duty work of the next four years. Uh, we will be updating. So just again, everybody feels these are very important uh, about the evaluating alternatives, the studies. Uh, I particularly feel that one is, and that will be a personal focus to be sure we're integrating those studies, the multiple lines of defense, and, and keeping a robust community engagement with a special attention on the needs of of uh, the federal guidance, what are called the Justice 40 communities. But we know them as places that have uh, people who don't have the time uh, to do some of these Zoom calls. So we have to have outreach to those um, communities that need special attention. We need all of your support as we move forward uh, with this uh, extensive effort. So I think we're time for question and answer. And I think they're gonna be read out. Is that the way we're going, Kristen? Yes, that's correct, Jim. Um, yep, <laughs> yep. We're gonna talk. We'll tag team it. Um, so thanks everyone for uh, all of your engagement in the chat. We've received um, quite a few very useful comments, and we're recording all of the comments and the questions in our notes. So um, thanks so much to Joyce and Casey, uh, Joanne, Sylvia, Vince, Laura, Anna um for all of your your great comments but we're going to start out with the questions so we can make sure that um we answer we answer all of our questions and um please feel free to to add more questions into the chat so uh our first question comes from silvio he asks would it be worthwhile to seek to expand the congressional mandate to the u.s army corps of engineers re ecosystem services benefit cost analysis. Thank you, Sandra. I'll start first. And then certainly if anybody else wants to jump in from the core team, uh, I just want to uh, draw the, you know, the public to the study authority. So that study authority is important because it's what Congress allows us to do and kind of sets the context of the study moving forward. And, and certainly the study authority uh, for this study is Public Law 8471, which dates back to June 15th, 1955, and really is looking at uh, coastal storm risk management, coastal storm risk within the community. And so that serves as the primary focus when we look at the benefits provided. When we formulate the measures, uh, it's primarily for coastal storm risk. And then when we look at the uh, comprehensive benefits, that's an additional opportunity to describe what the benefits uh, those measures provide for the county. So I think the uh, benefit cost ratio that we have now will help us do that when we also include that deeper dive into the comprehensive benefits. Thanks, Michelle. Uh, our next question uh, comes from Laura. Um, shoot, sorry, Laura, we didn't see your question um, while Lynette was speaking, but she asked if um, you could use a pointer um, while you're looking at the map. So next time, Laura, we'll definitely try to use a pointer when we're pointing out features on the map. But Laura also asks um, if we can elaborate on what is being planned exactly. Right, if you can just go back to slide 33, I wasn't following what you were saying with the yellow outline, and I just wanted to understand the locations you were considering for those southern points. Yeah, that's good. Um, wonderful. And, and if you could just expand on what you're sort of talking about now. I know the location originally 
um, and how that kind of fits in with, with BBC here. Thanks, Laura. This is Christian. I want to just check if, uh, if Pamela from our Division of Environmental Resource Management is on, so you might be able to elaborate a bit more. Uh, Pamela, are you on? Hi there, Christian. Yes, I am. Great. Yeah, maybe you could just give a quick overview for, for Laura's uh, question. Absolutely. And Laura, I caught the tail end of that. Were you talking specifically, or your initial question was about the yellow polygon features? Just trying to understand how BB Sear and Back Bay will integrate in, in the Cutler Bay region. Oh, got you. Well, it's, there's a, as Lynette alluded to, there's a lot of sort of, um, I would say like bells and whistles. Some of them integrate and are already sort of spoken about um, in what was BBCW or Biscayne Bay Coastal Wetlands for people less familiar with all the jargon that may have been discussed, but maybe not in a, an attentively selected plan for BBC or yet, or some of the features are, and we're trying to capitalize on them. An example of that would be the, the hot pink polygon you see sort of in the middle of the map where the water protection area is slated to happen as part of BBC. -er. However, BBC -er doesn't propose any particular features like pumps or any sort of other mechanism to move water. So that's an example of something that might be part of BBC, -er, but we're expanding upon it with something like um, features that can move water from canals into that water feature uh, and capitalize on that while helping to keep water away from those neighborhoods behind it and also protecting critical infrastructure like the wastewater treatment plant you see highlighted in purple patching. So there's really sort of a collection of um, features that are already um, part of, or as Lynette mentioned, part of what we had looked at as a tentatively selected plan in the first place, like the northern and central uh, Cutler wetlands, and then expanding that somewhat down south and then capitalizing on some projects that the county will be doing. So some of these stand alone, some of them integrate with BBC -er, and some of them are suggested in BBC -er, and should they happen, we have found ways to integrate those prospective projects, if that answers your question in a nutshell. That's wonderful. And, and maybe what we can do is just set up a meeting to get into the, the details uh, offline. I appreciate, I appreciate you going back to this map. Of course. Thanks, Pamela. Thanks, Laura. Uh, and a question from Joanne. She asks if there are any rough cost, estimate, cost estimates available yet. Hi, Joanne. So I will say that the team is continuing to work on the cost estimate. Now, this will be a cost estimate for the study moving forward, looking at part two. So we have not finalized a, a recommended plan. And at, at this time, I mean, we'll provide some very high level cost estimates when we're presenting to the Assistant Secretary of the Army. But the team is currently working on those estimates right now. So we will not have them until closer to August. Thanks, Michelle. Okay, um, a qu question from Silvio. Uh, can we access the worksheets for, calcula for calculations? Might, we might be able to give comments and suggestions better that way if there is a way to access an Excel type format. Silvio, can you clarify which calculations you're, um, you're asking about? Feel free to come off mute, Silvio, if you're still online. Okay, it seems like um, Silvio may have had to leave the meeting, but we'll we'll try to send out some some answers. Um, so moving forward, uh, let's see. Uh, Ada Curtis asks, in both proposals, you've shown possible nature-based solutions, but not proposed. When will the, these be changed to proposed? Now, that's a great question. Certainly, 
move, if we're able to move into part two, uh, we hope to uh, partner in some hydrodynamic modeling will help us uh, inform benefits that could be provided by natural nature-based features. Uh, but that um, iteration and the evolution of natural nature-based features that will be conducted in part two. So certainly as we work to towards what we call tentatively select a plan, we should have more formalized locations for those natural and nature-based features. Thanks, Michelle. Um, jumping to, I just want to thank uh, Roderick Scott for his comment about the flood mitigation industry. Appreciate you joining, Rod. Um, and then we had a, a question from Albert, and um, it's a, uh, a bit of a, a bit of a wind up, but I'll, uh, I'll I'll try to synthesize and summarize your question, Albert. So he just says, "Thank you. I appreciate we're trying to attempt a holistic one water approach to flood mitigation uh, for the coastal areas." Um, he has questions about construction and operational mitigation that would be required due to the scale of the project. Um, so it's, you know, recognizing a mix of green and gray measures and we'll be on a mix of upland, coastal. These like grass and wildlife during construction. Um, and so basically the question is, would the Army Corps be open to working with Miami-Dade County, um, Durham, the state Department of Environmental Protection and EPA for a flexible framework to help apply real time and ongoing mitigation dollars towards stormwater infrastructure to help align with Biscayne Bay um, efforts um, and help shore up financial gaps related to septic tank removals or um, other blue green approaches. So absolutely, as we work, uh, certainly as we define the Timley Selected Plan and then later a final recommended plan, a key part of that is the cost of mitigation for even when we're constructing natural nature-based features, we are replacing something that currently exists. So we have to account for that in mitigation. Certainly first we try to avoid, then we try to minimize, and then lastly we try to, uh, we work to mitigate. So uh, the mitigation should be um, uh, as in kind as possible, but uh, Justine, uh, would you mind speaking to that? Sure, uh, good evening everyone. Can you hear me okay? Okay, I'm gonna take that as yes. <laughs> um, so I think the question is, um, would the core be open to working with other, with the county and others to help apply those mitigation dollars towards um, stormwater infrastructure? Um, so as Michelle mentioned, um, typically, especially with respect to environmental mitigation will be looking to do replace in kind as much as possible. Um, this would be a question that we would have to explore further in part two um, as to whether or not um, that could be conducted and we could um, essentially apply mitigation dollars for out of kind uh, mitigation efforts. So that, that would be something that we may be able to look at more closely in part two. Justine, just one uh, clarification. Is it um, correct to say that our resource agencies, the ones that we collaborate with, they kind of help set how that mitigation, how that mitigation would occur to, to meet those objectives in terms of mitigating the, what's affected? Yes, thank you, Michelle, for adding that. Um, that's true. That would also, as you said, have to be coordinated. Uh, with the resource agencies. Great, thanks Justine, thanks Michelle. Um, the next question is from, from Barbara. She says, um, as a resident of Biscayne Island along the Venetian Causeway, I wanna be sure I understand the, the proposal or presentation. Do you expect natural boundaries of Miami Beach, the yellow outlines and gate at Key Biscayne to protect islands in the bay? And this is referring to the, the coastal barrier defense system and what that would mean for islands uh, in the actual bay, like Venetian Islands. Well, I, I mean, I, I'm sure Michelle can add, uh, or Lynette, to the possibilities of the enhanced 
beach work, but the the beach uh, erosion control project that was just authorized does provide some uh, protection the storm surge. So uh, it will reduce some of the energy of the of the wave coming across uh, the island and into the bay and where the bay islands are. So that's important to recognize that a well-maintained uh, beach project does provide protection. We want to build on that in the concept that we have uh, presented here. So I think that would mean if, if if the concept were to be evaluated and pass muster and to be built, that there would be more protection and less of a impact of a storm surge in the bay. So Jim, I will just uh, add to that, that when we, if we are able to move into part two, part of that will be to evaluate, um, to look into a hydrodynamic modeling model within Biscayne Bay. So as Jim mentioned earlier, there's a number of studies going on. Certainly the 216 study for the central and southern Florida uh, um, system and looking to do a hydrodynamic model so we can uh, work on the same platform between the two studies. And that would inform certainly the, the water, the wave action within Biscayne Bay. And then we would uh, be able to uh, identify what additional measures might be necessary to reduce uh, wave action in, uh, in Biscayne Bay. Thanks, Jim. Thanks, Michelle. Um, just want to recognize uh, Jenny Silver's comment about um, the benefits of nature-based features. Thanks, Jenny, for adding that. Um, John Wall has a question about the timeline. Um, said, is it accurate to infer that any start of any significant construction activity is at least six or seven years away? So our study, uh, if we are able to move forward in August, will be uh, four years, approximately four years. And then uh, beyond that, moving to a chief report, we would move into pre-construction engineering and design. So I would say it would, it would be uh, more than seven years away. Michelle, let me ask this uh, hypothetical. Sure. If we were to move through the process in a positive way, uh, obviously, if we're, it has to be positive to move through. Um, is it, is it uh, any experience the Corps has that we could kickstart, if we got to that place, met all the tests, we could kickstart some of the non-structural elevations and flood proofing? In, so that's uh, a great in the I'm same sorry, what Jim. you guys refer to as the preliminary engineering and design part? Yeah, that would be that next phase after the chief's report. Now, what you're recommending is certainly something as we look at phasing, uh, non-structural per a building may be more easier to implement more quickly than certainly something of, of a broader approach, uh, long, uh, a larger measure. So yeah, we may be able to get to something more quickly when we're looking at non-structural, but first that uh, next phase is the pre-construction engineering and design. That is uh, leads us to our first construction uh, contract, and then we would move into uh, the construction phase. So yes, that I anticipate uh, the non-structural may be easier to design because you're working with single structures uh, versus a larger measure. Thanks, Michelle. And thanks, Jim. I'll um, read one more question. Uh, we've got a, several more, but um, Alexander asks, uh, this is a good one, about um, regards to community engagement, are there any plans for hands-on participation or education of the community um, through the building process? And then this is being thought about in the budget as well. Um, gives the example of the, the Cristo Floating Islands projects that engaged hundreds of volunteers um, could be an opportunity to build education efforts and build stronger community buy-in um, and understanding through field trips, uh, restoration, uh, and so on. Uh, this, uh, Jim, I, I mean, I think the county's perspective on this will be, we should be doing everything that has worked in the past and, and try new ideas. Uh, I can tell you that, you know, uh, Mayor Kava, um, has uh, 
uh, asked for and the, and the county commission approved um, a, a funding for uh, resilience education uh, grants that would be made available to not for profits in a competitive process. And we're diligently trying to get that uh, fully approved by the county commission this summer so we can uh, get that moving. Uh, I think some of those grants and the organizations that will receive them could be looking uh, at how some of these issues relate because it'll be one of the things that's, you know, uh, important to the community uh, and certainly resilience based. And Jim, I can add to that, uh, we have a project called the Lynn Haven River Basin Ecosystem Restoration and that we had an event uh, in partnership with, uh, with the high school and it really was a great educational event and just to talk about ecosystem restoration. So I think if there are opportunities, that's something we can consider as we're working through uh, part two of the study. If there are, again, opportunities, billboards, uh, that can explain the benefits of partnering and then certainly with natural and nature-based features, uh, providing that education to the public uh, to see uh, that in, uh, in the process growing and, and providing benefits. Thanks, Michelle and Jim. Uh, our next question comes from Martina. She asks, are hybrid nature-based features being considered to retrofit existing seawalls and are biomaterials considered for the proposal of any hardscapes, especially sea, sea gates or anything going in the water that will affect the ecology? So one of the things I'll mention is certainly something that was considered in our Norfolk CSRM study was the opportunity to co-locate natural nature-based features alongside uh, the, the structural measures. And the benefits uh, for that were to reduce erosion adjacent to the, the wall features that were formulated. And certainly that's something that uh, could be considered as a potential opportunity there's definitely benefits, uh, natural nature-based features from erosion, and certainly that could reduce potentially operations and maintenance within that area that that natural nature-based feature is adjacent to. So it, it's something that could be considered. I'd like to uh, augment that and uh, highlight something I had, I mentioned only in passing earlier in one of the studies. Um, the, the village of Kibis Gain will be, uh, working with the Jacksonville district uh, and as their direct partner, but also with Norfolk and support uh, to do a, um, basically a, a combination a beach and back base study, uh, taking many of the measures we've talked about at, a lot, at the scale of the county and, and checking on their feasibility, if you will, for a smaller area. The back side of, of the, the base side of, uh, the village of Key Biscayne is primarily privately owned seawalls. So it could be that they will be able to uh, explore some of these issues and, you know, give us feedback uh, from that project. Uh, it's not in final design or it's not been kicked off yet. The paperwork hasn't been signed, but I think we're very fortunate the fact that uh, that study will be running parallel to the larger countywide study and we'll learn from both. Thank you for the update. Sorry, I was on mute. Uh, our next question is from Aida. And uh, she asks, given the multiple benefits of mangroves, will they be considered for nature-based solutions for the more urban areas of the county? So one of the challenges for the natural nature-based features will be to co-locate them where we have areas of damage. And so that will be our primary focus for those natural nature-based features, really focusing again on the study authority. Where is the damage occurring and where is the greatest opportunity for those to reduce risk? So that's will be our primary focus for locating those 
features. If I could add to that, Michelle, actually, I know um, it's it's tougher where there's not a lot of space to do the work, right? So I think along those public right of ways and other public waterfronts is, uh, you know, where we can be starting to look, but really important to coordinate with our municipal partners who are already kind of prioritizing some of those projects. Um, that's a great question. Okay, and uh, we have comments in the chat from Joanne. She says harmonization funds are needed. And uh, Rachel Road from EDF strongly encourages public monthly PDT meetings, as has been done in St. Augustine and Collier. And um, Doris Acosta suggests a presentation center with easy public access, similar to a sales center to a new building. She is a realtor, so she knows how much easy access to information with visuals impacts the su success of projects. Thank you, Doris, for your comment. And um, Rachel Road also suggests that it would be great to replicate something similar to Collier's uh, hub platform. And um, Rachel, we're we're on the same page with that, and that's that's something that um, uh, the Army Corps and county teams are are working on. And then uh, the next question comes from Albert. It's a two part question. He asks, with the term in kind mitigation, is that to be applied in place only or across the entirety of the Back Bay mapped study area? And can solutions and opportunities for force multipliers be tracked and accounted for in part two to inform the strategy while maximizing community benefits and ecosystem services within the overall mitigation approach? So I'll start first and then Justine, of course, if there's anything you'd like to add, I, I welcome that. Uh, I will just say just from my limited experience from environmental is the idea is to if you're the in kind mitigation is certainly to replace uh, is to look at to replace what you have impacted. Uh, to so that we have no net impact within that area. And the first priority would be to do it as close to the area of impact as possible. And then I believe then we would review from there what are uh, secondary opportunities to do that mitigation if you can't replace it immediately adjacent to where the impact has occurred. Justine? Yeah, no, Michelle, I, I think uh, that was a great response to that question. And again, that would be something that we would coordinate uh, with our resource agencies on in terms of just locating uh, those mitigation sites. Sandra, I think there was a second part, and I apologize, I missed that second part. I think you was talking no worries. about- Here, look, look, I can read it. Um, can solutions and opportunities for force multipliers be tracked and accounted for in part two to inform strategy while maximizing community benefits and ecosystem services within the overall mitigation approach? So Albert, I'm going to try and uh, digest what what you're asking here, and I hope I, I hope I'm answering correctly. So I think the team is really working hard to look at work that's already being conducted within Miami-Dade County, and if there's opportunities to complement that work with uh, measures, either for measures to reduce uh, coastal storm risk or for mitigation, I think that's definitely a win-win, not only for the county, but for all for us as well. So really looking for those opportunities to complement, and then like you said, would then be a much bigger uh, either mitigation or certainly measure for the county. Thanks, Michelle. And um, Joanne asks, can project cost cover historic neighborhoods? NIPs, neighborhood, or condos qualify? 
Do, do NIPs, neighborhood, or condos qualify? So cultural resources is an aspect of what we evaluate when we're looking at impact. Certainly when you're talking about uh, non-structural measures, uh, the, the movement away from how that historic structure has always been is something we have to consider when we uh, propose not, you know, elevating a structure or flood proofing a structure. So it's something that we include and then um, trying to mitigate that historic, that damage to that historic structure. And that could be, again, that difference from what it has been historically to what we're trying to uh, mitigate it to. That, it, uh, I believe that would be considered in the project as a project cost moving forward so that we are minimizing the um, impact to the historic resource. And really the focus of the non-structural measures or the areas that we're evaluating is really focusing on where that risk occurs. And that could be uh, new structures or that could include some historic structures. Thanks, Michelle. And I saw Joanne had asked a question about um, whether non-structural funds could elevate uh, buildings and um, short answer is yes to uh, certain buildings, including residential. Um, and saw the follow up there. Um, the next question is from uh, Raisa Fernandez, who asks, I have a um, uh, Miami wood frame home close to the Miami River. What would that look like if I'm interested in elevating my home? I think there's an open mic, but I, oh, or maybe not. Um, what we would look at to certainly evaluate uh, the home uh, that would be at risk. So we evaluate each, each structure based on the first floor elevation and then compare it to what we estimate that design elevation would be. And if it, that uh, structure or a group of structures is included in that non-structural measure, then very simply, and, I, and I'm, I know I'm very oversimplifying this, is a, you know, a contractor would come in and uh, look at placing, depending on your uh, first floor, whether that is a slab on grade or whether that is a, uh, a crawl space, they would insert, um, they would insert beams and ultimately very slowly jack up that structure uh, to a designated height and then begin to fill in either on either be on piles depending on the type of flooding that it is, whether it's a wave action, you certainly don't wanna have a filled in uh, foundation in that environment, or if it is a, what's called a, it's a, an A zone, but it doesn't have wave action, then it could be an elevated foundation on, um, on blocks, on blocks. So it'll be an additional uh, elevation to your um, foundation. And again, I apologize, that's oversimplifying. And they would certainly put it back down once they have constructed that foundation. Thanks, Michelle. We um, I think we had a couple of questions from Sil Silvio, who I, I think dropped off, but I'll, some of them I think were partially answered. So um, he asked if there would be uh, ability to get a list of the studies being considered uh, or perhaps a place to access a uh, process to request it. Um, so yeah, to get information about the studies that have been mentioned, um, right now, uh, a simple Google, Google search of the study name will allow you to get more information. Um, but we are, uh, as Sandra mentioned, um, uh, creating a website um, in the coming months that will put um, more of these studies in one place to hopefully be able to easily, easily access them. Um, another question from Silvio was about, um, if there's any way to incorporate citizen science for grassroots planting and maintenance of nature-based solutions? Um, kind of thinking down the line. Certainly I can start with that, Christian. So ultimately when we construct a project and we turn it over to Miami-Dade County, they then become responsible for the operations and maintenance of that, um, of that feature. And uh, I will defer to 
to Jim, but um, there may be, as he was mentioning, alluding to earlier, there may be opportunities certainly to engage the community in, in what that operation maintenance looks like. Maybe that's a clean, if it's an area, uh, unfortunately what we've seen previously is where you have uh, wetlands, they seem to accumulate trash. So it could be that that could also be an opportunity where you have a, a citizens who, who clean the natural nature-based feature and, and rid it of the trash of that area. Uh, Jim, what are your thoughts? Well, I know we have a history of, uh, of uh, nonprofit groups in our county that organize cleanups and um, Unfortunately, we need to do that because of the, uh, you know, debris that comes uh, onshore from uh, uh, in the ocean, the currents, and and comes down our canals. So, I don't. I, I think we would hope that as we move forward and and these projects are in place, one we've started to really address seriously our uh, you know, our waste problems, so that we don't have as much waste to dispose of, but then I think we could easily uh, find ways to um, support our not-for-profit groups who, who who always play a key role. Uh, I don't know exactly what we're looking at, so I can't make any commitment, obviously, but I think it's it's government working with partners uh, at that point in time, Michelle, where, like you say, where we're maintaining it, uh, and um, that's something that I think our community easily steps up for Bay Bonanza and other uh, activities to, uh, to to try to take care of the environment that way. Thanks, Jim. Thanks, Michelle. Um, another question Sylvia had was um, whether there was any current consideration for the value of blue carbon. Um, I'm not sure that it is, but perhaps something to look at with the comprehensive benefits in part two. Michelle, I don't know if you could speak to that in any more detail. Sure, Christian. No, thank you for that. And thank you for that question. Uh, currently, right now, that's not part of the comprehensive benefits that we are currently um, tracking. But again, we'll go into more detail in part two. I'm not sure that that will be included, but it'll be something that we can list as uh, we can uh, discuss with the team whether that is something that would uh, could be included for consideration. And we would um, we would certainly support that if it could fit. But if it, if it didn't, I think the whole area of uh, sequestration of carbon uh, using our natural systems uh, is something that we need to research with our university partners. Be sure that you know it's it's an, an accountable and transparent process. If it makes sense, uh, and, and even if it's done independent of this authorized study. Uh, you know, this is what we try to do in our climate action strategy is find every possible way to reduce, to get to a net zero of greenhouse gas emissions. And that could mean, in some cases, sequestration. And I see. Thanks, Jim and Michelle. I think Silvio had a, a quick follow up uh, about that, whether he can, so can I support uh, the blue carbon calculations? Um, offer for help. The question, can we support or? Yeah, I said, I think, uh, can he individually support blue carbon calculations? Oh, sure. Again, we, this is an area that we work with uh, what we call our um, Brazilian 305 uh, collaborative made up of our university researchers. Uh, I know Dr. Tiffany Troxler at FIU has been looking at this issue and probably professors at UM. So, not an area that our Office of Resilience right now has uh, experience with, but we always look to our partners in the universities to guide us. And thanks, Silvio, for your, your contact info. Um, uh, I think another, another question that Silvio had earlier was about um, any geospatial scenario simulations that are developing, being developed for these different um, considerations. So maybe Michelle, you could speak to what kind of geospatial analysis is being included? So a couple things. One, certainly as we uh, formulate the alternatives and specifically as we go into part two, we will outline what measures will be in those alternatives. And so we'll be able to have, we will have uh, shape files that 
define what those measures are, certainly at the draft stage, but also um, one of the lessons learned certainly from the first feasibility study is to develop, and, and this may be going a little bit beyond your, your question, uh, to develop um, images that the renderings that show what those measures look like. So where we are able to, uh, you know, when we have a draft plan, we can certainly provide some level of renderings to the public. I think that helps the communication, that helps the discussion and the interpretation of what we're trying to recommend within that area. Uh, and we've also learned what happens when you don't have those renderings available. So certainly want to get ahead of that and um, put the def you know put that rendering out for the public to uh, to digest and provide comment on. Thanks, Michelle. Getting getting some support in the chat from Aida and Silvo uh, applauding that comment and statement and offer for help with 3D rendering. Um, we have a question from Albert uh, about uh, compensatory mitigation. Um, he said, we currently have FDOT contractors building a large bridge over the bay and during construction, flood management on the site during storm events have created large silt plumes in the bay threatening seagrass. If this is occurring during construction, will these events and their subsequent damage be part of the overall mitigation assessment? I'll start and then uh, hand over to Justine, but absolutely. So that's part of the consideration. We consider what um, the construction process of uh, the effects that would occur, even if those are temporary, those are effects that would have to be considered uh, during the construction process. And then also with the, with the project in place. Justine? Thanks, Michelle. And I would just like to add that as part of the um, feasibility report, we would also include a monitoring and adaptive management plan. Um, so we would likely uh, be addressing that um, in that document that's that's also prepared as part of the uh, feasibility study process as well. Thanks, Michelle. Thanks, Justine. Um, we just got another question um, from Sueta. Um, as we battle the mitigation for extreme events, the energy infrastructure needs reorientation as we transition to an economy of clean energy. What are the goals and outcomes that could be expected in this direction? Um, I, think the, I, I mean, I think the county was going to be looking at any way we can benefit directly from these projects. The, the, but I think this is, I think the nature of this question really speaks more to, you know, the changes that are uh, going to address the energy grid as a whole that could come from further uh, re, uh, removal of carbon as the source of our energy in the grid. Uh, and then from how that's, you know, how we, how we are, if we have microgrid and to complement that. Uh, I don't know that that's going to be an outgrowth of this study, but I can tell you that in the Office of Resilience, under the auspices of our climate action strategy, that is something we're looking at uh, directly in our, I don't know if our energy, uh, Director of Energy, Dr. Gomez is on, but um, we'd be glad to address that question uh, offline so that the, the, the person asking the question can be fully aware of what we're doing in that area. Thank you, Jim. Um, I'm currently not seeing um, if anyone has asked a question or has a question that hasn't been mentioned. Uh, uh, please enter it in the chat or, or feel free to unmute yourself um, and ask it. But at this moment, I think we've um, gone through the questions in the chat and mentioned the comments, but um, folks, another opportunity here to, to I in. want to see if my good friend Rock Salt has anything to give give us in terms of wisdom. Jim, I'm not sure it's why wisdom, but I'll just speak for myself. We we for those of us that attended the two charrettes, there was just a whole lot of thinking ideas that showed up on the butcher board paper and all the stuff that was there. I was incredibly 
encouraged and impressed with what Jack with the Norfolk has done to to take all that input. I, what I what I've seen in the briefing and the questions today is to me a really solid frame of reference to take all those ideas to the assistant secretary and to the mayor saying we think we we think we've got enough here and we 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 really do we are ready to move forward a lot of the questions people have been asking are the kinds of questions that'll that'll pop up after we've after we're given the go ahead but but from from just from the standpoint from my seat and and people can disagree with me but from my seat i think the county and the norfolk did a really fine job of capturing the the sense and incorporating the details of of those two charrettes and i just applaud them both um and and so i'm i'm hopeful <laughs> that uh the mayor and the assistant secretary will, will um go forward and I, I by the way i look forward to working with the core on some of these mitigation ideas uh on some of these ways of thinking about ecosystem services back in the day when i worked up there that was really hard it is really hard and so but i hope we don't just say it's too hard i hope i hope we i hope we can be part of the the pace setters for doing some of these things uh uh for the country and for the core thanks Colonel Halbert, did you want to make any closing comments? Well, can you hear me? I want to make sure you hear me this time. Yes, sir. All right, great. <laughs> Thanks. I just want to echo what uh, Rock Salt, you know, just said, and um, this the collective team between Miami Dade County all of the uh localities and you know my team and that that includes uh, you know all the d additional assets that the enterprise has provided because we've gotten a lot of additional assistance from um you know outside of uh, the district and to include the engineering with nature uh, from from erdic that you know this is great effort to date to come up you know we, we've we thought big and we've uh taken that and um and come up with some very creative uh, ways to address coastal storm risk and uh i i believe that when we sit down with mayor kava and uh the assistant secretary in august that uh, we're going to be successful with uh moving forward so i look look hopeful look look forward to that day in august when we do that and um, just look forward to continuing being part of this this team and coming back and visiting Miami Dade County. So thank you. Christian, did we get any late entries? Or I don't want to. Yeah. Okay. Go ahead. Yeah. Looks like one more question um, from okay. Joanne. Um, she asks, is there any sense that the U.S. Coast Guard will weigh in on design details with an eye to raising the evacuation threshold? when gates are activated? Well, I can't speak for the Coast Guard. I know they will be involved. They're a agency that, um, you know, we have Miami sector right here and they are the captain of the port is the commanding officer at, at, um, at the sector. He closes and opens the port uh, today. That authority lies with the captain, uh, with the Coast Guard. And there would be a, a, a great coordination to anything that actually that gets built uh, to uh, that certainly affects the port. So I, I just see the Coast Guard as being part of our community. They'll be involved. We get to the operational level on some of these structures. They'll be very involved. Thanks, Jim. And then uh, Justine, did you want to add anything to that, or I think. <laughs> No, that that was good, Jim. I just wanted to say we have um, we are coordinating with the Coast Guard sector, Miami. Um, uh, we did have a meeting with them to begin right. those discussions. So, 
and those will continue uh, into the future. Thanks, Justine. Thanks, Jen. Thank um, one more question I'm seeing coming in from Martina. Um, she asked, given the long timeline, would an earlier phase, smaller scale, living shoreline or hybrid strategies be considered on a site like FIU's Biscayne Bay campus to monitor, iterate, and inform later phases? So Martina, that's a great question. Uh, the focus of our part two is to get to a chief's report and really that helps us get to the point where we can do construction, the chief's report, and then the design, uh, pre-construction engineering design, and then ultimately construction. So we kind of have to run through those processes before we can uh, construct anything on the ground. I, I, I would just say there's nothing stops us from partnering and investing in, in pilot projects. I know um, our consulting community has been working with the city of Miami on, on some projects that are uh, planned for uh, Morningside and um, Jose Marti. They're going to be cutting edge projects. We'll learn from them. The city of, of Miami Beach. Uh, I know, um, Christian, you, I think, or somebody, one of our slides that Lynette mentioned, uh, you can drive by and see some of these new uh, applications. And we, and we have Resilience Florida grants, uh, the other 300 million appropriated this year by the legislature. And so, you know, some of these projects uh, can be used that money. And if somebody wants, if we can engage FIU in something, uh, we'll be a part of looking for that. Even, I know the core has, if I, you don't get this screwed up here, guys. There's a non a non authorized small project uh, uh, program that you can tap for some projects. Uh, it was used I, at Mount Sinai Hospital by the Jacksonville folks. So I, you may be referring to the Continuing Authorities Program, yeah, right. uh, which allows us to uh, construct, uh, allows us to investigate and potentially construct uh, smaller. Yeah, smaller uh, projects like a uh, shoreline protection. So that might be that project that was constructed. So that yeah. the great thing about that program is it is it is capped uh, at federal funding, but it does not require additional congressional authorization. So the yeah. goal is to more quickly construct something uh, uh, depending on the authority, such as shoreline erosion or flood risk management. Right, and Jacksonville would probably be the one that would be taking those. Uh, inquiries, right? Absolutely. Yeah. Good. What do we got? We had a great time. How are we doing? Yeah. I, hey, I think hey, that covers the questions. Hey, Jim? I see Rock has yes, sir. Rock. Rock. Yeah. yeah. What I wish I'd have said this when you called on me. I, I, I believe the genius of the package is that it treats, essentially treats everybody equally. One of the downsides of the of the core's normal pro NED analysis is the more economic benefits, the more likely you are to get a project. And the way this has been laid out, the, the it, it basically treats everybody essentially the same. I mean, I, I, I think it, I've never seen a project that has sort of got this inherent uh, benefit, this inherent uh, sort of truth uh with it and i and i just that's we did we you we mentioned a little bit in the overview but i believe that both the assistant secretary and the armies uh uh underserved community goals and the mayor's equity goals i i think the both both of the pro all of the projects essentially no matter which way we go the we have we have found a way to to balance that out for for equality across the county. I, I really ap applaud everybody uh, for that. Moffat Nichols, everybody for 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 all of that. Thank you, Rock. Anything else, Christian? Um, yeah, I see. Silva, so you you added a question in the chat. I also see you on the screen. Did you want to unmute and ask your question, or I can read it in the chat as well. Yeah, go go ahead. Sorry, I was um um go ahead and read the question. Thanks. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so I think it's related to uh, uh, previous question too. 
about how it'd be great to pilot multiple small community projects to plug into the later inversion and inform the analysis going forward. Um, so he's asking if it's possible to get a small pilot grant to do so. Um, and you kind of talked about that a little before, but I don't know if there's anything else you want to add to that. So pilot projects, Silvio, is that? That's right. Yes. If, if, if we're exploring living shorelines, nature-based yes. solutions, and we can do them in, in smaller areas, in different yes. areas with different conditions, and perhaps, I mean, with, with, within this multi-billion dollar endeavor, there's ways to, to do smaller si bite sizes that, that could support, as well as maybe even speed up the timelines in parallel to the larger goals of the project to, to reinforce the, the larger project, eventually bringing those two, uh, 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 marrying those two uh, together uh, over you know, the course of the next five years or, or however long it'll take. Well, I think we have both, I mean, the, certainly the county wants to look at anything that can bring some uh, positive benefits soon. But we are respectful. There's never a billion dollars on the table, right? So, so that's the total cost over decades. Uh, they have to scramble and we have to fight for every appropriation uh, across that landscape of projects that we're doing. But are there other places we, we can look for funding? And I think um, that's where I think uh, if it's a municipal pilot or, an, or another way we can get something uh, that we educate ourselves from, on the ground in Miami-Dade County, that's great. And Jim, I'll just add to that. Certainly, if there are local projects like we had mentioned before, certainly I believe on the backside of Miami Beach, things that we can learn from as we are formulating the natural nature-based features, we were open to looking at those examples as well. Okay, that'd be great. And yes, Jim, I'll, I'll go ahead and work on that and and I try to unlock, I know NOAA is interested in funding some of these community-based projects for nature-based solutions and living fur lines and mangroves and this kind of, and, and things of the like. Um, you know, so we'll, we'll maybe circle back on that a, a offline because there's some policy. Significant uh, uh, federal things. funding uh, just announced last week uh, from NOAA. So, yep, good point. All right, Christian. Thank you. Are we ready? Yep. Yeah, it seems like um, there aren't any more questions. So really appreciate everyone's time. Uh, like we mentioned, look out, look out for updates um, kind of leading up to and, and after August. Um, yeah, I don't know. Any closing thoughts, Jim? Well, thanks everybody for um, giving us your time. Uh, it was well worth our time. We, we always learn uh, from this kind of input. Thank you to Colonel Hallberg and his team for uh, giving us your after hours. And uh, I think we are uh, in a position to declare this call adjourned. Great, thank you.